It's unprecedented that a president takes center stage on every night of the National Party Convention, but President Trump has and will continue to do so. And if there's one thing we've learned, it's because that he is unconventional. Indeed. The preview of what the president might say during tomorrow's acceptance speech, Director of Strategic Communications for the Trump campaign, Mark Lauder joins us now. Great to see you, Mark. Good to see you, Mark. Good morning. Talk to us about the strategy of having the president involved in every night of the RNC and what we can sort of expect from the big acceptance speech. Well, I, I think having the president involved each night is giving the viewers at home, whether they're watching online or on television, a glimpse into the various uh, to the various activities of the president. It's not just what you see in a in a in the podium or what you see on cable television and news. You see him welcoming five new citizens to this country. You see him offering a pardon to someone who's doing so much to help people who've been incarcerated successfully transition back to society. So I think it's been a, it's been a great, it's been positive, it's been uplifting. And, and tomorrow night, uh, you're gonna see the president talk about not just the successes that we've already had, but where he wants to go and the fact that we can deal with the challenges we have in our country and still never question our ultimate success because we're America. Mark, we saw some of the initial ratings. They seem to be a bit down towards the DNC. Are you concerned about those television ratings or do you have other online figures that you can bring us? How are you guys feeling about overall viewership and reception so far? Yeah, no, no. The online viewership really drove drove the night for us uh, on Monday night. In fact, I think when we totaled up the television and cable ratings along with the online platforms, we had about 10 million more people watching night one than uh, the Democrats did on their first night. And so we are very encouraged by that. And I think that's one of the things that the campaign has done so well is we're engaging people in different platforms. So not everyone is sitting at home watching on the traditional cable or, or news outlets. Some of them are watching it on their phones. They're watching it on their tablets, and we're making that content available to them in the way they want to consume it. Mm -hmm. And Mark, you referenced the, the pardon that was granted last night, also the naturalization ceremony. I have to say both of those things I thought were really moving and really touching. But there's also a question, are they legal? How is it not a violation of the Hatch Act in your view? You know, first and foremost, the Hatch Act doesn't apply to the president and vice president. They're specifically exempted from the Hatch Act. But secondly, I think what we're seeing here is the president using the opportunity to showcase what it's like to be president and some of the great things he's doing. And that centers around the White House. And so you know, I understand that some folks in Washington, D.C. are probably up in arms about, you know, norms. But folks out across America, I don't think they see that. I think they just see the president doing his job, whether it's issuing the pardon or welcoming new citizens to our country. Uh, and you're and even the first lady last night in the Rose Garden highlighting so, was such a great message, such a positive message. So I think you're going to continue to see that. And, uh, and we're going to continue to deal with this unconventional convention in these times, uh, but do it in a way that's, that's really kind of bringing people in so they have a better understanding of who Donald Trump is. Mm -hmm. And you know, Mark, we've been tracking the polling here very closely. We've seen a lot of tightening in many of these battleground states. Which are the states that you are feeling most optimistic about right now? Which are you going to be putting in a lot of resources? See tight race in Arizona, um, even Wisconsin has been shrinking as well as, 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 well as Michigan. Uh, well, all 50 of them, of course, but <laughs> uh, Come on. But what yeah. I would tell you is that when you look at the, the travel schedule of the president, the vice president recently, they've been to uh, Minnesota or are going to Minnesota. They're spending a lot of time campaigning in Wisconsin. It was noted by the vice president last week when he was there during the Democrat National Convention that both he and the president went to Wisconsin, where the DNC was located. But Joe Biden hadn't been there in what, I think, 665 days or so. Uh, it's really remarkable that we're seeing so many of the same patterns and mistakes made by Hillary Clinton playing out again in 2020. But you're going to see the president and the vice president on the road. They'll still continue to be in the battleground states. We're going to take this message directly to the people, even if they're socially distanced. Mm -hmm. Mark, what is your assessment? More importantly, what is the president's assessment of the current state of the economy? And what is the uh, economic agenda to get people back to work and make sure they can stay in their homes and be able to provide food for their families? Well, we're seeing tremendous growth in the economy right now. Obviously, more than 9.3 million jobs created in just the last three months. In fact, nearly half of the jobs that were lost because of the coronavirus have already been recovered. But the president wants to continue to do more. It's why he's talking about, in his second term, creating 10 million new jobs in 10 months, bringing a million new small businesses online. And that's just by continuing the tax cuts and deregulatory policies that the president has been enacting since day one. 
which is in stark contrast to Joe Biden, who wants to raise taxes by $4 trillion, reimpose government regulations, and, in, and engage in job-killing energy policies that would put a, you know, a million or so Americans out of work. I mean, frankly, Mark, tax cuts and deregulation sounds like what Republicans have been running on for 40 years. Um, is there any sort of unique economic messaging? This president, you know, ran on a very different model in 2016. Is there anything that would distinguish him from past Republican orthodoxy on these issues? Well, I think first and foremost, he recognizes the threat that China poses and bad trade deals pose. And he's going to continue to fight to confront China. He's going to continue to fight to bring manufacturing jobs back to the United States. In fact, one of his platforms he'll be talking about is the need to bring pharmaceutical and medical manufacturing back to this country, because we shouldn't be reliant on China or anyone else for the, the drugs that could help us in this coronavirus or at any other time, or even just the basic medical supplies to be able to protect frontline responders, teachers, and others who need those supplies to be able to successfully get back to work. Mm. Well, Mark, appreciate you joining us. Thanks, sir. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Next on Rising, was it identity politics on display or a true show of diversity last night during the RNC? We're going to discuss when Rising continues.